Yes, hello everyone. So, my name is Daniel, and today I'm going to present on Malpedia, which is a project that I've now been pursuing for almost two years. Uh, first, before we get into it, let me thank my co-workers on this one. Um, so, Martin helped a lot with the evaluation framework and statistics um, that we've used um, to present some of the results that are later in this talk. And Steffen basically programmed most of the uh, website and platform that's basically used to um, deliver the data and um, interact with, with Mapedia. I must my supervisor and um, I'm always happy when I can talk to him and uh, exchange ideas. So the outline for this talk is basically I start with a summary, so you get directly into the topic and what's it all about. Then I go back about two years in time, uh, motivating how we came to that idea and what basically has happened until then. Um, I give a layout of the approach that we have followed and then present Mapedia itself. And the next step is basically showing you what you can do with this corpus. So essentially what I'm presenting here is a very clean um, corpus of malware, um, of unpacked malware actually, and then going a bit in the future. So for the summary, um, what is Mapedia? So from the intention, it's basically a free, independent, pooled resource for confidential labeled unpacked reference samples for malware families and versions. So um, everything in one sentence basically means I try to um, have a good coverage of many families, then have their versions tracked as well, uh, trying to limit it to as many, uh, as, as few samples as possible. So I want to have a small corpus that's still very representative, and I'm very happy to share this kind of data. Um, at the same time, um, along with the samples, it makes sense to track all the metadata, because right now, um, if you think about it, how are you going to find blog posts on something? You go on Google, and that's a lot of effort. Uh, otherwise, we could basically directly attach those references to the samples so you have everything in one place. So that's one of the ideas here. And since we have a nice corpus, um, we can also basically test and develop our Yara rules against it. So that's just some of the ideas there. So looking about one week ago, I had roughly 2,500 malware samples there for around 670 families. And I'm targeting multi-platforms, so not only Windows malware, but also uh, embedded stuff, IoT stuff, APKs, OSX, uh, JavaScript, because that's a thing as well, and everything in that uh, corpus. So the contributions of this work, um, because there's also a paper to it that will be released later on, um, first we define some requirements that we think um, are a useful thing to follow if you're basically creating such a corpus, and then we provide our vision or our take on this corpus and the platform as well. And um, the second part is basically we do a comprehensive quantitative static analysis, so basically looking at the structure across all of those families and um, provide some results on that as well. So how did all of this begin? So um, who was at WhatConf 2015? So um, some of you guys, I have to do it that way, um, might remember that there was this thing. <laughs> so quite a bunch of DJA talks and um, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those guys. So um, I basically presented on my, my previous project, which was DG Archive. So basically a clean collection of um, algorithmically generated domain names. Um, however, as, as much ranting there was on DGAs, um, I, I still feel from the feedback I received that's a good project because um, when you provide created systemized data, you can do really good stuff with it. And also since it was launched, I had more than one and a half million queries to DG Archive. So it seems like it's also used by some people. Um, in 2015, there was another thing. Um, does anyone recall this slide? It's actually from a lightning talk. So there was this, this plug, what? plug X. So um, basically, when Crowder gave his lightning talk on that we have a synonym problem, basically, with malware. So everyone is referring to stuff in a different way, and we cannot really come to a consensus. And what he basically proposed is, let's, let's try to do something and fix it. Um, I didn't really talk to him, but I thought also it was a good idea because when I basically came back from BotConf, uh, I, I looked at all the data that I had. So um, from several years, I had um, basically the idea, I'm sitting on a pile of investigations that I've done. And the way that I structure them is them normally probably by date, I have the sample, I might have a dump, might have unpacked samples, might have an IDB, some, some text and write-up for it. And while it's somewhat structured, it's still a mess. And um, what came to me is basically, it might be a good idea to do this in a way more structured fashion. So um, I thought having a code-centric inventory um, that's basically focusing on static analysis would be like really, really good because um, 
we can basically resolve over our synonym and naming problem with that because it's, it's like a Rosetta Stone where you have pieces that you can refer to and basically put just a name label on it because code is basically the basis that we can find consensus on when we try to name stuff, I guess. Yeah, and another thing that I've learned from DG Archive is basically um, we as a Malware research community should definitely start thinking about preservation. Um, because when I tried to recover as many DJS as possible, I ran into stuff like Xenovol or TDSS that were uh, active around 2008 to 2011 or more. And it's very hard to find samples for those families by today's standards. So even if I'm very sure that they are somewhere in the, in the depths of virus total and hidden there, um, it's hard to find those exact samples that um, consist um, or basically contain the DGA code. Um, especially if it's not like a first stage dropper or something, but a module that's being pulled, um, it can be hard to find that kind of stuff. Uh, so basically having this, this archived repository of another families might be a good idea um, from that perspective as well. So for related work, um, so Eric is not here this year, but at least I wanted to have him in my slides. Um, he's been doing this uh, Botnet's FR project, which is basically a wiki-like structure also trying to cover many different malware families. Um, but in that sense, it's just metadata. Um, there's also the zoo that was referenced yesterday because um, you were using it as a label injection when you do, uh, were doing clustering. The um, thing there is basically it's still mostly packed malware and it's only semi-structured, let's call it that way, because you sometimes have folders um, that basically contain um, the same family or you have one folder containing more than one family and stuff like that. Um, Virus Bay is a quite new project. Um, it seems to follow some same ideas that I've been doing with Malpedia. Um, but I think it's more focused on knowledge exchange than actually trying to build this kind of archive that I'm uh, pursuing here. And finally, you have projects like ID Ransomware um, that also, I guess, keep their collection, but it's basically hidden and not accessible directly. So basically, to outside, it's also only um, metadata. Yeah, so also the, the title is basically Inventorizing Landscape. And what do I mean by that? Um, so it's basically a kind of a sling now. Um, it sounds a bit like cartography, and that's basically what I, basically my vision for this project in the, in the long run is. Um, so cartography in a historical sense is basically done with baselines. And the fun fact is basically in Bonn, there's one of the older ones of such baselines. So in, in Bonn, we have this distance of around about two kilometers, um, which has been used to measure a very long stretch of, of land afterwards. So you basically have this plate, which basically tells you what it was used for. It's basically a pillar somewhere in Bonn. And from a theory, uh, you would measure other points that you can see in the distance, and then by the angles, um, derive basically the, the span that's basically with, between those um, points that you are measuring. And in those times, basically it has been used to, to cover the whole distance from Aachen to Zurich, so around about 400 kilometers. And that kind of started in Bonn. So that was just some fun fact that I wanted to bring up here. So apply to malware, um, we could do that as well, I guess. So if we are trying to collect some reference points for families and versions, we could measure code somehow, or at least do an indexation on it. So that's basically my vision for this whole thing. So I thought, okay, let's give it a shot. And that was basically run about two years ago. So for the approach, um, I thought it might make sense to go one step back and try to do it systematically from the start. So what are probably some goals that you would want to pursue if you build a malware corpus? So um, I thought there's this work from 2007, uh, 2012 by Christian Rosso, and he defines some prudent practices that one pe uh, people would, should follow if you are doing malware experiments. And I thought, okay, let's review it and, and try if we can find some things that we can reapply. And from that, we basically um, found our own requirements that are basically more tailored to our special case, which is um, basically looking at static analysis. So some of the major goals that you might have in mind there is you want representative data. I think that's pretty obvious because um, you want to have coverage in multiple angles at the same time. It has to be temporal um, in a good sense, so you can probably do some historical analysis on malware. Um, it doesn't make sense to limit to a platform because you still can out a piece of the corpus afterwards if you want to do that. And um, if you want to do some analysis on the evolution of families, you need to have different uh, versions as well. Um, the second design goal was basically to have everything in an accessible format. So it's, it has to be easy to work with. So that's very important. And for me, it was of utmost appearance to have 
unpacked samples, because just putting labels on packed samples doesn't really help, so unpacked is cool, and um, to some degree it also makes sense to clean them up, because if you have process injection, you might have some fragments that are not really related to the family, but are still present in, in the me memory dump that you're doing, um, so you have to do some post-processing to, to have actually really cool data. And while we're on it, um, let's not just stop with labels, but do all of this, this meta data thing directly in the, in the same run, basically. Yeah, and finally, um, I thought, okay, this should not be academically isolated, so let's see if we can find some practical use with it as well. Um, so first off, it probably has to be topical and maintained in there. So it's not just that I now dumped this, this whole corpus thing, but I, um, I, will, I will try to, to have this maintained. And um, basically, that's the collaborative aspect to it. Um, I invite basically all of you to contribute to this kind of repository because I guess it benefits all of us. And, and finally, it probably also makes sense to provide some tooling so that you can basically work with it. So um, for me, it was quite important, and that's still a lot of work to have uh, good Yara coverage of all of the corpus, because that really helps us solve maybe this identification problem. Yeah. Finally, um, Fraunhofer that I'm working for is a nonprofit organization, so um, we can step into some degree as something vendor neutral, and maybe we can reach some consensual ground truth here. Okay. Let's go back to, to Christian's work. Um, so like I said, it's basically a list of things to consider when you're doing experiments with malware. And it's basically 18 different aspects that are organized into four categories. So first, you want to ensure that you have a correct data set. Um, but that means you probably have to divide between goodware and malware, um, that you want to keep balance across the families that you're using in your experimentation, that you separate training data from evaluation data, that you have to think about artifacts and all of that kind of stuff. And um, that's basically things to consider. Um, since we are building a malware corpus, the, the good aspect and the experiment aspect to it basically does not really um, affect us. Um, but there's still some, some good ideas to, to put in. Secondly, um, you want to do transparency in how you publish the results. So that means that you publish the data set, that you explain where the labels are coming from, uh, which ex experiment setup you have been using, and that you also do uh, a very um, scrutinized analysis of your results. So when you do, for example, um, a classification method that you explain how true positives and false positives and false negatives basically uh, constitute themselves and, and why they are happening. Then you want to do realism because you can live in the ivory tower and do all your isolated experiments that you want. Um, if you want other people to use it, you probably have to look at relevance and that means that you have to look at the real world. And in that sense, basically, the, the experiments should be designed in a way that's similar to um, how malware basically is encountered in the wild. And finally, um, safety is also something to consider, because um, if you're working with malware, you might potentially um, pose harm to outside parties, so you have to think about the deployment and containment that you have to put in place. So for us, um, we basically came down to six things that we thought would be good requirements for uh, a good malware corpus, and um, it's basically limited to static analysis in that sense. So I already said that, so uh, representative content is, uh, makes sense. Uh, we want to do cross-platform, because only doing Windows is kind of not no longer the time now. Uh, unpacked samples, accurate labels, and do the documentation part, because uh, we want to explain how we um, came to that data and um, basically what the context of it. And, and finally, um, that's something probably debatable, um, but I think the creation should be controlled in a sense because I want to ensure that the um, format that we've been using to set up this um, corpus um, still stays the same and stays intact, and um, also this dissemination should be limited. So it's, it's not that you can just go to the website and download everything, but we uh, employ some basic vetting here um, so that we can at least to some degree ensure that the data is not flowing wildly. So for representative content, um, we want to look at relevant malware. That means um, if we do it that way, it's probably also useful um, for, for incident handlers or for other instances in the, in the real world and that, that might be doing research. Um, one thing is we favor quality over quantity. So it's, it's not the, the goal, basically, to grow the corpus as fast as possible, um, but rather look beyond uh, what we can now call something like a pecker barrier. So um, if you look at how most campaigns are operated, you will find um, polymorphism in, in, in how packers are basically applied to, to certain versions of malware. But beyond this, this packer barrier, 
um, it comes down to way less different versions that you can actually observe in the wild. And that means we can basically limit ourselves to only representants uh, of a version for one family. Um, and that really is an aspect that helps down uh, boiling down this data set to only the, the necessary parts. So just to give you an example for that, um, we've been doing malware config data mining since 2012 as well. And if you look at Citadel, for example, which was a very popular family at that time, um, we had run about 100,000 unique Citadel samples over time. Um, if you run all of them, do dynamic analysis, uh, very similar to what we've seen by, by SERPL yesterday, um, you probably cannot identify many more than like 21 versions for all of those samples. So um, if you're only interested in archiving the code and the evolution of Citadel in that sense, uh, you can probably achieve a data reduction factor of maybe 4,500. So um, in that sense, we would not be interested in, in storing all of the Citadel samples, but only one per version. And that's something that you can also observe for, for a bunch of other families as well. So there's, there's a huge amount of, of Tinbar going around, SPROX, but there's normally only some mainstream versions because they are maintained by, by some malware author. Um, and, and he has to basically publish that as well, and, and that basically ensures that there's not that much flowing around. So basically this, this code maintenance aspect that you have on the side of a normal malware developer um, basically affects them as well. So they probably have to have some distribution channels and are not as fast as, as pushing uh, versions, or at least not if you look across all of the malware landscape. Yeah, cross-platform, um, yeah, it's 2017, so let's be real. Um, we had some major incidents over the last year that basically affected non-Windows systems, so just do it that way. So be it Mirai, uh, Lucas is basically twittering a lot about uh, recent malware on, on Android and stuff like that, so just incorporate all of that as well. For unpacked samples, um, that's basically essential if you want to do effective static analysis because you don't want to worry about packers, you just directly want to be sure that you're working on the actual malware code. And um, here it's discuss discussable if you want to do dumping or unpacking. And um, I have the opinion that dumping is actually a better way to approach this because normally some of the intermediate parts that may occur during the unpacking process of the packer itself um, are not really of interest unless you are doing analysis of packers and dumps usually also contain some more runtime data. And this can be decrypted strings at times. You may have some dynamic API usage, so basically you have so more API coverage than you would have in a cleanly disk unpacked sample and do not have to worry uh, of finding the routine that's basically doing the, the API imports and stuff like that. And it's also way easier to automate. Um, because, like I said, you can normally just run it and at a certain point decide that you want to take a dump now. Um, furthermore, um, I think dumps also can serve as some kind of normalization because there are certain malware families that only exist as shell code. So um, having them on a disk basically would mean that you have to find that exact point where the shell code is staged by some loader into memory or whatever. But if you say, okay, I'm really just interested in dumping it, then basically I have the same representation, which is memory mapped and initialized for the shell code and for every other program basically as well. Yeah, accurate labels and metadata. So basically this whole project is somewhat centered around um, family identification. So that means we first need to find some accurate labels for the families in the first place. Um, but also there should be, for example, plugins tracked if we are able to find those plugins. So say you, are, you have a banking malware which is different information stealer plugins, um, we're also interested into archiving those as well. Documentation, um, yeah, like I said, so looking at Christian's um, prudent practices, basically explaining how we got to the dumps is something of importance, or basically um, where we are getting the samples from. So that basically allows to ensure that we have accountability and repositability. So when we are doing experiments, um, you can do them as well, and hopefully we end up with the same results. Um, tracking the origin of samples um, normally means since I get most of the samples from publications uh, of AV companies, threat into companies and the like, um, I probably try to include a reference where I basically got aware of the hash in the first place. And explaining the dumping me method and environment stuff, we, we get into that in, um, in a couple of minutes. Yeah, controlled creation and dissemination, so the last point here. Um, like I said, we want to ensure that the structure of the whole repository uh, stays intact, even over the course of time with having more users and having them contribute to the data. And limiting access is basically 
needed to avoid harm to the general public. Because if you just download the stuff, let it run, that's probably not a good idea. Or you might have some users that are not really into uh, familiar with how you treat malware, and they might just download it and double click it, and I don't want to be blamed for that kind of stuff. Okay. So how are we going to put this now into practice? Um, I will first explain some of the terminology. So basically what I mean if I call something a family or something is unpacked and stuff like that, then I explain the collection approach again in some more detail and how we produce those dumps. And finally, how the corpus is uh, organized. So if you're later on uh, working with it, so that's probably of, of interest to you. And also how, how much data we already have in there right now. So what's a malware family? Um, it's from a modern standpoint, I guess it's not really cleanly defined um, what a malware family is, and everyone probably has their slight different fuzzy um, definition of it. So I'm just going to try and give you my current definition what a malware family is. So basically all samples that you can find that belong to the same project from a developer's point of view. So basically, um, the way we are tracking families means that someone normally has the respons uh, responsibility, has created the code, is maintaining the code, and that's basically what defines a family for me. Um, what this allows you is that you can basically also group those components to this family that only work in context of the family. So be it some customized loader, some plugins that are interacting with the, the main module of the family and stuff like that. Um, but it also allows you to basically deal with stuff like source code leaks. So look at Zeus. Um, I'm, I'm not going to call everything Zeus that's basically derived from Zeus. So we can split off stuff like Citadel, Ice9, Game Over Peer to Peer, all the, the later stuff. Um, in the same way, you can also look at the same project that has been a rewrite. So um, there's a couple families in there, like three or four, I guess, um, that basically are the very same malware but rewritten in another language. So you would have someone start out with Delphi and uh, suddenly he thinks C is cooler, so he rewrites his, his malware in the same way, just in, in C, for example. Um, what's an unpacked sample? So for me, that's a direct representative of the family. So um, there's no longer other third party code involved that's usually used to protect or obfuscate or whatever do on it. So um, third party in that sense, basically I have a malware, family or maybe a sample that I've created with a builder and then apply the packer to it, um, the unpacked sample would be basically, again, the sample without the packer and stuff. However, this does not in include, for example, addressing the obfuscation. So if the obfuscation is part of the malware family itself, um, unpacking, to me, does not mean that I have to remove this obfuscation because it's basically a feature of the family and, for example, can, can help to identify it. Um, and from a classic sense, because that's, that's basically how I, um, when I got into it, but what we meant when, when talking about unpacked malware, it would be something that you are able to run from disk again. So basically the um, probably unmapped version that's on disk, you double click it and, and the malware is running directly. Um, opposed to that, what's a dump sample? Well, the clean memory capture of the malware, and it normally will in include some initialized data, and that's an issue. If you want to go back to the, the unpacked runnable sample from, from a dump sample, you normally, or sometimes have the, the, the point that this initial data, initialized data basically um, will interfere with you and the sample will just crash. Um, but dumping can also include that you um, look at some auxiliary modules that the malware might have or some of the other memory that it has um, allocated, where it's, for example, storing some of its imports or some additional code that's, that it is jumping to and that you also track that as well. So, once more, this, this quality over quantity thing. Um, the philosophy that I've been pursuing is um, I rather want to extend the coverage to as many families right now as possible than going deep into a single family. So um, I, I could basically say I, I want to have the best coverage of Drydex and TrickBot and what, but that would probably take a lot of my time that I can allocate to things. and. Um, Right now, still the idea is to, to get a good coverage in, in the wide sense. So that's basically this, this quality thing that you can use it to identify as many different families as possible. Um, there's a strong emphasis on verification. Um, by now, I've been doing a lot of manual work to ensure that basically this is a very clean corpus. So that's also a way to push quality, but it's um, a lot of effort, <laughs> let me tell you that. Um, 
It can also mean that we prioritize on families that are more active or more impactful. Um, normally, I'm somewhat following my filter bubble and look at the blog posts that I would normally encounter and um, probably prefer those as well. So um, by having more contributors, probably this basically will have the impact of um, widening uh, what we consider as, as uh, something that should be prioritized. Um, in the long run, it is a really good idea to write some means of quality assurance. So say you have a Yara rule for every of the families, you can also ensure um, that your Yara rules do not have false positives on other families. And in the same way uh, that they are still recent enough to um, find new versions whenever you add them to the corpus. And with regard to data origins, um, I prefer public sources where possible. And basically everything that's in Wikipedia is also found on virus total. So it's like 97%. So I really uh, want to have stuff that can be obtained in another fashion as well. Um, okay, I said we do uh, multi-platform stuff um, because it makes sense to track that as as we are progressing, um, but I'm still having a strong focus on Windows malware because um, that's at least where the most families are still documented, where we have the most history. So that's basically um, what I've been focusing on with the dumps. Um, the method that I employ there is basically to have very fixed VM states that I use to derive the dumps from. Um, what's the benefit of that? Um, well, I have very known and fixed system parameters to it. So for example, even if it's using ASLR, um, most of the static Windows API function offsets will remain the same in, in all of the different uh, memory segments that you will encounter them. And this allows you to apply some techniques um, to rapidly uh, extract those Windows API functions on arbitrary dumps, as long as they have been produced by this um, basically environment. So I'm using mostly Windows XP and Windows 7, and no one is gasping, but it's so old. Why are you using like, operating systems that are like more than 10 years old? Um, it's pretty easy because it still feels like most malware is feeling most at home there because um, you have fewer embedded um, protection systems by the operating system uh, directly. So um, my goal is basically maximizing execution success. So I want to have the most vulnerable um, system there is. And that works kind of good. Um, as well, what can you do as well? Uh, of course, you should um, install all the runtimes. You want to have all the .NET runtimes because um, you really have to give your malware a, a place to feel home and it has to run and it has not to crash. So I'm really interested in producing dumps, so I have to make it for the malware as easy as possible to run. Uh, yeah, with regard to dumping, uh, methodology is, is pretty simple, I guess. You just run it, wait, if the memory that has basically changed during execution and then filter down to what you think is the unpacked version, so basically the dump, and then you potentially repeat it because you missed something or there's nothing to basically extract or what frequently happens, you have to interact manually. And that's quite painful. So um, if I had to guess, I guess I've spent more than 600 hours of doing this, this unpacking and dumping already. So um, on the other hand, I think that's sadly the only way how to get dumps for some of the families because what you can observe there is basically something that gets mapped is fingerprinting your environment and will unmap itself um, if it's not happy. And that's totally something that most sandboxes will not give you or even if they gave it to you, you might just drown in the data. So um, I have quite some experience, I guess, with, with unpacking and stuff. So um, in many cases, it was more natural to me to just look quickly at something and then try to, to cover it up that way. Um, in many cases, what you can dump there is already fine, but sometimes, like I said, you will have some overlay of, for example, the packed sample and the unpacked sample in the beginning of the same buffer or something, so it makes sense to basically cut off the tail and, and things like that in order to, to clean up the malware. Because if you're later applying static analysis methods to it, uh, you really only want the code of the actual malware family and not the shaft that's basically on its tail. Yeah, and for identification, um, yeah, the better your Yara coverage is, the faster you can do that. Otherwise, it's also manual investigation. Has someone basically blocked somewhere about those strings that I've just found in this buffer that I'm looking at? So, a lot of work. <laughs> so, let's open a shell. Um, if you're interested in how the data is stored, basically, it's, it's more or less this um, tree-like structure. So, on top level, you would have platform.family name. And, for example, let's take URL zone, something that I'm very familiar with because I have been looking at it for a couple of years. Um, below the family folder, you would have ideally folders per version. 
So that basically allows you a direct grouping. Um, in those folders, you would have samples stored as SHA-256, and along them, you would have the dumps with basically the base address from where they have been dumped, as well as unpacked samples in some cases, not all cases. And that's basically the whole repository structure for all of the data that's right, uh, right now in there. Along with that data, you have a JSON file that gives you some meta information, like the block references that I've just mentioned, the, the last time it was updated, aliases for the family, uh, actors that have been observed using the family, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, for many of them, there's also a Yara folder um, sorted by TLP um, with rules in there. So basically everything beyond TLP wide are already contributions by users of the framework. And you would have one Yara file per Yara rule because it also eases um, versioning and management of the stuff. So now the good thing about this kind of file system-like structure is um, this is basically our Git repository format. So um, if you want to have the data set, it's as easy as doing Git clone. And you have all of the data at once. And if you want to do updates, you do a pull request, uh, basically a git pull, and then you have the most recent version of it. So that was our vision of having it in a convenient way so that you can do the same experiments or whatever you want to like with that data set. So um, this commit, as shown there, is basically the root commit, and it's also the commit that we've been using for all of the analysis that I'm going to show um, in a few minutes. And this, at that time, was based on 17 or almost 1,800 samples with around about 600 families. Um, if you look at the distribution, of course, Windows is the majority. That's also probably the reason why I'm, um, because I'm feeling most at home with Windows malware. Um, I normally try to include Android whenever I see someone talking about Android malware and stuff like that, and, and same for the other families. And everything that's basically multi-platform is either you know, um, written in Java or some JavaScript, like, for example, used by Tola and stuff like that. So basically Chrome extensions and whatnot. Um, with regard to unpacking and dumping, um, about 90% of the Windows stuff is actually, at least from a family perspective, dumped with at least one dump. So sometimes I have families where I have multiple samples, but only one dump, because like I said, quality or coverage first, um, in that sense, I want at least one representative for it. And 12% of the 12 are just unpacked, so altogether, it's probably 75% of the samples are uh, definitely in some unpacked state. Yeah, so those 24% are missing right now. Okay, so how do we make this stuff accessible? I already had, uh, said to you that there's this Git repository that you can check out, um, but there's also a website because the, the title was basically a collaborative approach to it. So um, first let me start with the, the mission statement, what I want to basically achieve with this Mapedia thing, and then explain some of the, the trust mechanisms that we have uh, implemented in order to ensure uh, basically access limitation and also contribution quality. Um, the website that's listed there is already accessible, so um, if I'm just going too fast, you can also, I think, just go to on uh, Google and already search for Mapedia. It should show up in the top five, I guess. So the, the primary goal, as I said, for this project as a whole is basically to provide a community-driven independent resource for this whole identification stuff. So basically, if you have an account on there, you can propose changes to the data set. So if you know of a family that's currently not in there, you can propose it. If you have some samples for a family that I don't have or versions that you have identified and just want to see them in the data set as well, um, you can do all of that. So basically, what's then happening is there's a group of peer reviewers that will basically review your contribution and then it's probably uh, accepted or otherwise uh, rejected with a note what you should improve in order to have it in there. So basically just how you would uh, submit stuff to a conference or similar. Uh, we are adopting the, the, the traffic light protocol. Uh, Mark just said his uh, personal experiences with that and I hope it's, it's turning out better in, in this project. So um, most of the non-critical data is basically TLP-wide. So the whole inventory, and that's what you will see if you go to the website, um, it's basically openly accessible as well as the aggregated statistics that I'm going to talk about and the references as well. Everything else is Ember. So if you have an access or basically an account for the platform, uh, that basically means you have to keep it to yourself in your um, institution. Um, there are some resources within there that are designated otherwise. So you, you already saw in this, this Yara thing there might be TLP green, so there's other ways to share some components, but the majority of the data is really intended to stay Ember. 
Yeah, and if you want to get an, ex uh, an account there, uh, we use some basic form of vetting. So basically, existing community me uh, members have to vouch for you. Um, so basically, we know who is accountable if you do stupid stuff. And this might fall back to them. So there's basically a system that's very established um, in stuff like Obstrust and such. Um, and we are basically just using and orient ourselves on that. Yeah, I talked about this, this peer review thing. So um, if you don't have data to contribute, but are good at malware analysis and um, have a good grasp of the, the malware landscape, you can also do reviews here. So that's also a way to contribute to this project and the platform. Uh, like I said, normally two votes are required to either accept or reject a proposal, so you get some more um, sort of grounds to base a decision on. And what we're also planning to do is uh, doing some achievement stuff. So if you are frequently reviewing things, so right now it's just fantasy points and you cannot do anything with it, um, but in the long run, I guess we might provide some more services that um, basically will have some quota because they are more computationally intensive and basically more contributions would allow you to get a higher quota to that kind of stuff. So if you want to defend the Earthrealm together with me, uh, feel invited. Okay, so in summary, um, the baseline data set that I'm offering you right here is um, around about 670 families, 2,500 samples with very clean labels, I hope, um, and already some contextual enrichment, but there's many, many gaps that want to be filled. And it basically would allow us to have this kind of Rosetta Stone that um, basically uh, tracks all the aliases that different people are referring to when they talk about malware families or actors for that instance. And um, depending on how active this thing is going, it can also basically become something like a newsfeed because um, if you keep the references added for families all the time, you see what's happening or what's uh, more in vogue at the time and um, get the, all of the blog posts directly from one resource. So it's kind of an aggregator. So it's, might hopefully become that thing. So it would be really good because then I don't have to crawl my Twitter feed all the time. Um, we are using basically the reference data by MISP for the threat actor uh, repository and whenever uh, we are not able to reflect something that we want to do in Mapedia, we also contribute a make and um, like adding an, an actor into their directory or merging uh, some of the aliases and, and stuff like that. So um, MISP, really good thing. Um, then again, we also want to um, foster automation support. So basically everything that you can access on the website also has a REST API. So if you want to do searches, uh, there's a Python client ready for you um, where you can just directly int integrate it into stuff that you already have. Okay, so now I've been talking a lot about the project and the data set. Um, what I now want to do is basically do a bit of showcasing what you can do with that kind of data. So I had this, this vision. Uh, that I want to compare across many malware families and find if there are some uh, similarities or what basically some of the trends of malware authors are. So the data that's been used um, in this thing is basically the, the commit that I just referenced, so around about 1,200 dumped files for almost or four, four, six families. And in this presentation, I'm only going to address three things. So um, we have compared PE headers across all of those families. Um, we did some very cursory code analysis because that's like a rabbit hole and um, it totally would not fit the time slot of this presentation if we had already presented all of the results we have there. And on the other hand, Windows API usage, which is very interesting because um, I guess that's one of the cornerstones that we as analysts most um, rely on when we are looking at malware. So that's the whole inventory of families. Right now, um, it's probably still easy for you to find something that's not in there. Um, but that's basically also one of the problems because if you're looking at a lot of stuff in parallel, you have to aggregate to some degree. So what I'm now going to do is, in, in most of the times, um, basically look at the aggregated samples per family and then compare the results on that level. So let's do a very short recap of what PA does look like. So that's your usual uh, PA header, for example. Uh, one of the more famous things here that you normally look for is probably the MZ magic, the PE magic, so basically the cornerstones that we use to, to find stuff in dumps. Um, then there's also this DOS string thing that might or might not be very common. Um, there's a rich header that might contain some interesting information. Uh, there's the machine field that tells you if it's either 32 or 64 bits. Then the number of sections. We have heard, also heard uh, earlier yesterday about that. Uh, and a timestamp, 
And for example, with the timestamp, normally you as an analyst, you don't really know if you can trust the timestamp. But if we are able to compare this across 450 families, we might get a trend how often this timestamp might be an actual value that's basically realistic or not. Um, there's also characteristics fields that defines how the malware basically can be loaded on the system. You might have a linker info that tells you some more about um, how this thing was potentially compiled, um, which operating system is required in order to be able to run it, the subsystem, in that case it's like the value three, so it means a console application instead of a GUI application, uh, DLL characteristics, those contain a bit of information about the security um, that this file is uh, capable of handling on, for example, if it supports ASLR or not. And then finally, you also have those 11 data directories um, that also contain some interesting data. So the above diagram may or may not include some Easter eggs, and it's up to you to find them. So um, for the result presentations, it will be in that kind of table. So on the left side, um, across all of the samples, and on the right side, aggregated per families. So let's first have a look at how often you will normally encounter some kind of MZ or PE uh, magic at all. And here the first, the good news is, taking this as an indicator for the availability of, API, um, of, of PE headers, in a good 95% of the families, you actually find this stuff and you can extract information from some kind of PE header. So um, what you can see here is um, I have some more that I can basically extract from that are having MZ magic. So sometimes you can see that malware is basically just deleting DMZ or just DPE, um, but otherwise the, the header stays intact. Um, but only basically just one part of the story because there's more funky stuff happening. So um, some of the reasons why you might not find a PE header in that case. So for a good 30 families, um, you would have 18 times position independent shellcode. That's basically not in need of a header. Seven times basically the segment that's executed would directly start with some data. Or in, in, in five cases, you would have an IIT instead. And for seven families, you can find that five of them basically null the whole PE header. So with some more effort, you can basically extract it before it's nulled. And for two families, you can also observe that it's XORed. So one does it with a one-byte pattern, the other one with a four-byte pattern. So um, that's a bit inconsistent. So up there, you can see um, 27 versus 37 families. The reason for that is basically that only some versions of some families are using those um, destruction of PE headers. Yeah, those strings are also available in like 90% of the cases. Um, in general, you will um, find three different variants for those. So basically, the, the most prominent, this program cannot be run in DOS mode, but the other ones are basically tied, mostly tied to Delphi. So that's one of the easy ways how to spot uh, wall and compiled stuff. Uh, rich headers are a, less, a bit less common, so you will only find them across all of the families in, in around about 60% of the cases. Um, it's a proprietary standard by, by Microsoft that basically encodes um, how many times things have been um, compiled with Microsoft Visual Studio and also with the different versions of Visual Studio that may have been present on the system over time. Um, there's a paper from Dimva this year that goes in a bit more detail about that. It's, it's really interesting. Um, the next thing that we might have a look at, so say we have a PE header, um, the vast majority, again, is 32-bit uh, 32 images. Uh, one reason for that is that I've been using 32-bit windows a lot to dump that stuff. Um, but for about 15 families, you would find that they also have 64-bit um, modules. So for example, um, some of the more modern bankers, like Raftar, TripWrite, basically dynamically decide which of the modules they want to use, Rydex the same, and, and things like that. And on the other hand, what was a bit surprising to me, almost every fourth family basically has their main module as a DLL opposed to an XE file. Um, with regard to those um, security measures, as expected, um, malware is not really keen on basically having those. So for example, if we talk about relocatable malware like ASLR, uh, it might be a sense, um, might make sense to just deactivate it because it may ensure that your malware is running a bit more stably same for an X, I guess. So only in, in about half of the cases uh, you would find those security features activated. Um, Timestamps, like I said, are really interesting. So for almost 90%, um, we have a non-zero or not Delphi time value. Um, Delphi time value because uh, Delphi 4 contained the bug that basically always uh, included the same timestamp there. And um, 
you can also read about that. <laughs> and now let's have a look at timestamps in a bit more detail because that's basically what I just said. So if you want to look at the age of the corpus, we can, for example, check um, when those files have appeared for the first time on VirusTotal. And if you look at that data, it looks somehow like this. So about 90% of all the samples that I have in there are basically 2013 and later. So going more in this preservation direction, um, if you have basically a lot of samples that are identified and predate basically this border, I'm really happy to take them and integrate them as well, just to, to increase the historical coverage. And the oldest sample right now is a, a GOSI sample from 2006. So um, if you want to estimate DPE timestamp accuracy, what we can do is basically um, use the field from the PE header and the virus total field and do the difference of them. So looking at those 1,200 dumps I have to, to start with, uh, I can deduct them that don't have a PE header, um, then those that have a null, null field, so they are not really useful in, in doing this kind of analysis. Um, another 30 don't have a virus total timestamp because they're not on virus total. Um, you will find some timestamps then that are certainly faked because they're in the future. So basically they would have been submitted to virus total before they have been compiled, so that doesn't make sense. And we can also filter down to this, this range, like earliest sample until now. So uh, I did this late October, so that's the, the upper border. And that leaves us with 949 candidate timestamp pairs that we can look at. And here the distribution looks somehow like this. So mine again, this is basically the number of samples. And what we can observe here, um, a good 10% are basically, so basically this black line directly to the left um, is a, submitted to VirusTotal on the very same day that you can find the DP timestamp. Uh, a good 30% are within the first week, 50% within one month. So um, at least in, in many cases, um, it's, it's likely that the PE timestamp will be somewhat correct. So sometimes you have to consider what's happening after the compilation. Maybe the guy gives his malware to someone else or it depends on a packer that is basically as an ex external service. It has to be delivered to spam campaign. So that basically explain, explains why you might have some, some gap there. So altogether about 80% of the timestamps lie within one year of the uh, P compilation time. So 206 samples fall out of this range. Um, a good third of them has APT background, so that's something that you can observe. Sometimes you get an APT report published and someone two, three weeks earlier pushed those samples referenced in there onto virus total and they have been withheld before. That's probably one of the reasons there. Uh, sometimes you have leaked builders. So if you are now using Citadel Builder, it will still contain the uh, same stuff as, as four, four years ago or something. So this means why you might have fresh samples with a very old timestamp. Um, for some families, I know that they have been using forgery because some other fields are also faked. And um, for, the, for the rest, I have no idea why it's that. So probably also forgery or some, some other results. Um, then again, we had a look at the um, compilation of those families. Uh, so using detected easy or similar methods, we can I identify uh, around about 500 data points across those families. And here, Microsoft Visual C is by far the most uh, common compiler chain that's basically used to, to create malware. Um, one data point kind of sticks out there. So VC6 is used almost as much as the more recent ones, which was a bit surprising. Um, then again, VC6 also gives you basically linking against the, the standard uh, runtime that's always on Windows. So that basically also ensures that your, your, problems, uh, your program's not crashing if it's basically not finding its dependencies. Yeah, we also have rich headers for around about 760 different samples. And basically in all cases, um, it's consistent with the linker field. So you would have a matching uh, product ID in the rich header compared to um, the, the compiler linker field. Um, data directories I'm not touching here because that's also way too much data, but there's gonna be a paper. So for control flow graphs, we did some very fast um, or cursory disassembly on all those families. Uh, what you can find there, your average malware is probably um, around 440 functions in size. Um, so, so most of the malware is basically um, around that size. Uh, what's very interesting, um, if you look at the correlation between, for example, functional basic logs, functions and in, instruction in and stuff like that, um, they seem to have a very high linear correlation. So normally you would have 
roundaboutish 9 to 10 basic blocks per function and 50 to 60 instructions per function. And this was a bit surprising because that basically means that there has to be some uh, connections in the code that um, are probably worth looking deeper on. And on the other hand, um, maybe personal coding style is not as expressive as we hope when we are using um, these kinds of codes of finger, for fingerprinting authors. But that's basically research in the future. Okay, um, PDB information, what you basically have to speed up a bit, um, can see there is basically in at least 50 cases, um, the PDB string basically gave also one name of the malware family. So if you're wondering where all those names are coming from, PDB strings are at least one of those sources. Yep, Windows API usage, so I still want to cover that. So I've been I've published a tool earlier this year, which is API Scout, and it's basically something that helps you with uh, API reco uh, reconstruction for known environments. So we first want to look at the usage styles of malware. So basically, are they using an import table, doing dynamic loading, are they having obfuscation at that kind of stuff, and then the frequencies with which uh, APIs are used. So the idea here is basically you can brute force a memory buffer and um, find those static offsets. So if you're doing dynamic analysis, you are very familiar probably with this um, import address table format and the way that normal um, basically unpackers or dumpers work is basically that they pass the structure and reconstruct it. But in many cases, um, you will also run into some issues basically dumping and, and fixing them. So what I thought would be a good idea um, is basically just looking at every D word in a buffer and, and checking if it's potentially one of those APIs. And that's basically what API Scout does. Um, it's also having an IDA plugin, so you can directly use the database that you have here for, for your operating system, um, get all of those values resolved, and, and can directly apply them. Um, it seems to be a very accurate approach as well, because I've been testing it on Goodware, and it performed good there. Uh, currently, it's not working on IDA 7 because the Python API is totally broken. Um, usage styles, so across 380 families that are not .NET, so are directly interacting with the Windows API, um, it looks like this. So the majority of the families is using standard imports, so a good 46%. And on the other hand, um, almost the same fraction is doing dynamic imports, another 50% that's here. So those are very easily uh, reconstructable with API scouts, which is very good news. Um, on the other hand, obfuscation for API usage seems not to be that common, actually. So um, there are some of the methods listed, um, but less than, I think, 20 families right now. Um, but I still have to go deeper, and um, this statistics will be updated over time, so this, this number of obfuscated families will increase potentially. Now, little quiz, what's the most common API call across all of those families? What, virtual protect? No, sleep. <laughs> Why sleep? Um, I guess basically if you want to orchestrate autonomous behavior, sleep is like very generic. You can use it to delay CNC communication, you can use it to delay execution and basically orchestrate how a program is running. Um, so many of the other ones probably are also uh, usual suspects. For DLLs, um, very much the same. Um, but I was not really happy because if you look at it that way, um, you still end up with like 3,700 different APIs used across all of those families. And the graph for those looks a bit like that. However, there's very good news. Um, the pattern of this graph basically tells us that the composition of APIs that you find for a family is probably rather unique. So the API footprint that malware has might help to, to identify it. And that's probably also a reason why Impash and Imfuzzy and stuff like that kind of performs quite well. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna skip that, so basically I've also been doing API context groups, so I labeled another 3,000 of, of API calls into groups, so we end up with uh, like GUI, execution, string, all that kind of stuff, um, because otherwise you, you run into this issue that if you look at network, you have different ways to achieve the same effect. So you could do HTTP yourself using SOC, or basically um, the VS32 DLL, you can use WinSOC or use the, the HTTP higher level DLLs. And that basically, this API context group is a way to, to merge them to some degree. And looking at it that way, um, we can see that not every malware seems to be using um, network. If you think of modern or some of the ransomware families, they are just showing you an email address where you have to contact their author and stuff like that. So that might be a reason why they're not calling out to their CNC servers. 
Um, same for the other data as well. But um, what I'm doing right now is mostly showing you data and the slides that will be available directly not, uh, after the presentation so you can read that up uh, also by yourself. Okay, so what's the future for this project? Um, of course, we want to maintain this data set and extend it. I hope that um, you like it that much that you want to have an, ac an account for it and, and want to interact with the data. So that would be like a really cool thing. And since it's focused on identification, we probably extend some of the um, aspects here as well. For, for research, um, I guess what I showed to you today is basically only scratching the surface. And the, the next step I've already begun is basically looking deeper into it. So doing basically code indexation across all of those families. So the, the major goal would be to identify unique code or shared code across all of those different families and ultimately getting a better idea how functionality is encoded into malware across all of those different families. Okay, so basically the public launch is today. If you want to have access to it, come talk to me. So I run by the principle of Nomad Trust. So if you talk to me, you already did uh, know and met, so that's a good thing. Uh, otherwise, there's some existing users um, who can now also invite further users, so that's the way how I want to grow this thing uh, organically. With that, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Daniel, uh, for your work and for your uh, talk. Uh, are there any questions? Tom. There. Thank you for your talk. Very interesting project. Um, you you talked a lot about executables, um, and I think you just briefly mentioned something about JavaScript or Java archive, uh, like Adwin Rat families. Um, how many of those do you have covered? Also, like PowerShell malware and all kind of like the non-executable malware types. How much of that do you have covered? Yeah, it kind of depends on, since I'm mostly looking at public sources, those are uh, less likely to encounter in public archives like, like VT and stuff like that. So um, if you have pointers to them, I'm very happy. So I think right now it's maybe like 30 families or something. So it's not as much certainly as the other ones. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. There is a question just right there, Anna. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was, uh, seems like a really good, great uh, tool. Um, my question is very simple. Can I get an access? <laughs> huh? Yeah, sure. So that's, that's basically what I just said. So uh, come talk to me and we can arrange that kind of stuff. Okay. There is a last question over there. Hi, Daniel. Great research. Uh, when describing uh, the malware families, are you just focused on static parts or do you also describe based on the behavior? Um, so right now, it, it's really focused on static analysis because I want to have clean dumps because um, that is something that we can disassemble and then dive into. So that's the idea here. Um, I do not intend, for example, to have like cuckoo reports for all of that stuff. So that's probably also not representative because you always have the packer in front because there's no clean unpacked sample and you don't know where basically to cut uh, into the, the runtime behavior, more or less. Um, but that's basically something that you could do by just using the data, for example. So if there's another one who wants to pick up that stuff and um, present those, those uh, cuckoo uh, runtimes, happy to do so. Okay. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, 